We're on page 176. Rabbi Abraham ben Rambam was telling us that a person should be as courteous as they can to other people. As nice as they can to other people. Even a rude person, even an unrefined person. And it comes from a place not of self-deprivation, but a place of... I feel bad for this person. You know, he's a nebach. He's a... It's an... I'm going to go out of my way to just be nice, even though they may not deserve it. But it's not... I'm in a better place in life. I'm in a better status almost than I would... It's not right for me to just pick on them. At the fight with them, I, I have rahman, I have compassion, and I will be nice with them. But there's a flip side to this. And this flip side, unfortunately, we struggle with very much in the world that we live in today. Today there's a demand for equality. And with a demand for equality, there's a demand for everyone to be the same. And there's good that's come out of that. There were things that were unequal for no good reason. For example, what does the color of a person's skin have to do with their level of intelligence or accomplishments in life? But for the majority of the history on this earth, today included, some people will think that a person of a certain skin color is better than a person of another skin color. There are people like that. There's no stupider belief than this, but it exists. Let me move the word stupid out. I don't say that this is a stupid belief. I can't imagine even that people walk around with such a belief. And so the world came, and at least we attempted to straighten out this this approach. Did it work? I, I don't know. I'm, I'm not. It worked. Definitely, we've come light years from where the, we used to be. Are we where we should be? Maybe not, but that's. Baruch, it's because it's unplugged over there. Oh. Hmm. And what we find is that there perhaps were times in this country and perhaps still today where women were treated differently than men were treated and that could even be something that we found that are among the circles of faithful Jewish people. And as time has gone on we've tried to straighten out these <coughs> flaws. But just because there were things that were unequal for no good reason and now we fix them doesn't mean that everything is equal. Not everyone is the same. Forgive me, but I don't feel bad when someone tells me that Albert Einstein was more intelligent than I am. It doesn't, I don't feel offended from this. Albert Einstein was a pretty intelligent human being. Yeah. Now, there's a limit to what intelligence counts for, by the way. Just because someone's intelligent doesn't mean that they're right about everything, correct? And you understand that intelligence is not everything. Just because someone can hang on their wall some shiny diploma from a top-notch university doesn't necessarily mean that they're smarter or any kind of person you ever want to take advice from. But it might mean something. When you meet somebody who's a professional in a certain field, so they're able to demand respect in that field. Why not? Why should the professor be of the same status of the student? It doesn't mean that he er is arrogant and showing off, but there should be uh, hierarchies in the world. That's okay, this is a normal thing. When we try to undermine this, that's when chaos comes out. You know, you see this a lot with uh, anybody in a leadership position. I'm not talking here rabbis that. Uh, from presidents to prime ministers to mayors to even non-political positions, uh, presidents of boards, CEOs of companies, there's a natiyah, there's a certain inclination today that, oh, if I was him, I would do a little bit of anava, a little bit of humility of, you're not him, there's a reason why he's there and you're not, there's a reason why, there's a reason why the State Department doesn't call me up for advice, you know, as much as I might think I have good advice to give. There is order in the world. Is it always correct? Not always. But when we start to get rid of that order, we reach a place of anarchy. And anarchy is not healthy in any society, in any place. And so we have to talk about the flip side of when you don't have to be humble and which person is exempt from doing things that other people might be obligated in doing. V'imzot, so nonetheless, en sorech. There's no need. Aflo it's not even proper, it doesn't look good. Afasu, it might even be prohibited. Shiheha dam bal ofi kaldat, that a person should 
have this appearance of being foolish because they're so humble for, to everybody. Evili, frivolous. Bazui, umushpal, degraded and lowly. Kidon, for example. Zeham nashek etidei am ha'aretz. He who kisses the hands of an ignoramus. Onoten lo kdima, or he gives him precedence. Umsharteu tamid belot tzorich dati o chomri, and he serves him frequently. And obviously, this is all unless there's no religious or worldly need to do so. Could be that you're in a situation where the, the mayor, the wealthy person, the general of the army, I want it. He's a good for nothing ignoramus, but uh, the, it has it now that he's in your house visiting and you have to serve him. Okay, fine. Don't happen sometimes. There's some people that go out of their way to give respect to everybody else, and even people that it's not within their own dignity to respect and freaking mean them for saying this, because the world is not ready. We no longer believe in such things, but it's incorrect that we don't believe in such things. You know, when I go to see Perez, I kiss his hand. And when I was a student, he used to let me kiss his hand more often. What is the halakha? You have to kiss it on the hand. But there is a halakha? It's a, it's a law like that. We don't shake hands, it's for know, proper European... Uh, to do, but uh, is, what did the rabbi say in the Talmud? How silly are the people of Babel, of Babylon? Do they kiss the dead Torah, but they don't kiss the living Torah? Mm. They kiss Torah scrolls, but they don't kiss Torah scholars. This is like, I mean, for a time in memorial, we kiss Talmud and Hamid's hats. So when I was there, you know, you, know, you could, he would let you kiss his hand, and as you grow up and you move on and Specifically when my wife comes to visit with me or when students of mine come with me. So he no longer lets me kiss his hand. Why? Because in front of them, it's not proper for me to do that. In his opinion. It's not correct. It's good for them to see that also. But in his opinion, there's a time and a place for everything. I mean, right now when you're coming as a rabbi of students, or you're coming as a, uh, a husband to someone, or this child, uh, not, you know. On the other hand, when I bring Al-Khanan to him, and uh, I ask him to give a a blessing, so he'll say, yeah, kiss my hand, and then I'll give him a blessing. Why? The parents of her never told him to kiss his hand. Because he wants to teach a two-year-old that it's important to learn the midot, to learn proper character traits. So if a person were to reverse this and to kiss every guy in the street's hands, it would be, it would look not just silly, he says it would be improper, and it, it might even be prohibited, says Sheenzo anava harawiyah le shevach. That's not praiseworthy humility. It's not commendable. Kim bizayon vahashpala hamurim al chesron dat vechesed. These my manadins, the words they use. Such behavior is not commendable humility. It is degrading and undignified. It reflects a lack of intellect, which is foolishness. Velo midot turmiyot or itnagud dati to musarit. And it doesn't show excellent character or religious path or courtesy. When a person goes out of their way to degrade themselves, it doesn't look good even. It's not even, it doesn't come off as, wow, he's so humble. Maybe the guy's crazy. And the ignorant indulge in excessive chatter and eating, social drinking, and similar repugnant behaviors. These are from the ugly character traits that are almost forbidden. Such behaviors are practically forbidden and are certainly not admirable, for they lead to depraved conduct and sin. The status of a Tamil Chacham has gone away in this generation for two reasons. One is, like I mentioned before, a respect for a hierarchy no longer exists in our society, at least not a genuine one. Today we run after fame and money and who has fancy cars and who have big houses. It's not so much to do with who's worked on themselves and who's a dignified human being and who's refined and who's an intellect and who's a philosopher, and who's a, but rather uh, very external things. And the second are because, unfortunately, we have many people who wear the cloaks of Torah scholars who are not actually Torah scholars. Many people who call themselves rabbis who are not from the I'm not far from talking now bad about anybody. 
but rather today you have the yoga rabbi and the boxing rabbi and the running rabbi and the monkey rabbi and the you know uh, uh, ballet dancing rabbi and, the, and all the whatever rabbi. And I'm not coming here to be mezazel. A rabbi is allowed to do many things. Right? There are more things that I do in my life aside from being a rabbi. But when you feel that the title rabbi is so not fitting for you that you have to add another title to it. And when you don't appreciate your rabbinics, unless you happen to be the rabbi who runs marathons, or unless you're the rabbi who lifts weights, or I don't know, the rabbi who eats watermelon and watermelon in competitions, so what it tells you is that you didn't, you don't really take yourself seriously. It has to do with the way rabbis carry themselves, not dress. I don't care. I was, there's no way for a rabbi to dress, but to carry oneself, the standards to which they hold themselves, things that, you know, maybe a normal human being can do this, but. I, and not just a rabbi, I'm of a certain people, I'm of a certain level of refinement, not me, a person can say this, depending who they are, that I wouldn't do this, or I wouldn't do that, even though I'm not something bad, just it's not, you know, the way a person dresses around their house. I, I ha very rarely go to people's houses, the reason is, unless I plan in advance to go to somebody's house, rarely am I invited in the first place, but when I, I don't knock on people's doors. The reason because I come to this house and I, I, I don't know what they're thinking. It's 5 o'clock in the afternoon. They just got home from work. They're in their underwear and in an undershirt holding a beer watching a football game. I don't want to see my congregants looking like that. So I just, I just don't knock on the door. But it tells me something about a person. And I, you could tell me that I'm wrong. I don't care. That, listen, you in your bedroom, you want to dress, you want to walk. Fine, but in your living room at 5 o'clock in the afternoon, the sun hasn't even set yet. People are still knocking on your door. You carry yourself with a certain level of, of dignity, or you don't. There's what to be said. I'm even even those who understand understand what I'm saying. I don't need to elaborate, but I want to show you two halachot that perhaps tie into what Rabbi Noah Muhammad Alam is writing, because this is very important, and I mention this every time he says this. He'll mention extreme levels of humility, but always afterwards he comes to show you that it's not always fitting to be so humble. There are times where a person has to know limits to the character traits that we preach about. It's important for a person to pray, but if a person prays all day long, it's a problem. It's important for a person to study Torah, but if they study Torah to the exclusion of supporting their family, that's a problem. Every character trait that is good can have extremes which are negative. But those, those are never taught. Very few people are teaching and the limitations of the character traits which are, that people should have. So I want to read you two halakhot, they, they stick out to me. First is a simple halakha, not simple, not for me, uh, pretty clear cut halakha. In Shulchan Aruch, Allah Chaim, the first books of Allah Chaim, in chapter 170, there are all kinds of, they're not halakhot, we're going to get to them, but they're min hagei derch eretz, customs, the good things to do during the meal. Actually, why am I taking out this book? Let's do this. Never mind. We're not going to do it. It's two chapters, too. So. Um, Mahan writes the following. Nikiyei hadat shebi The Nikiyei hadat means those of clear intelligence. Those of, those of pure refinement of Jerusalem. The sages of Jerusalem. Lo subin bisuda. They would not agree to accept an invitation to someone's meal, a party, a dinner, a wedding, a bar mitzvah, whatever it would be. ken yudim mi Unless they know who will be eating there with them. Meaning, tell me who else you invite. Mipnei because shegnai hu letamit chacham because it's disgraceful for a Torah scholar. Leshev etzalam haaretz bisuda to sit with an ignoramus by the meal. And Mishnah Bo'at says a filu b'sod mitzvah even if it's a mitzvah meal, it's a, a holiday meal, a Shabbat meal, it's a wedding. Let's understand. There's no prohibition of a righteous person sitting next to someone who's not so righteous. So don't, don't start making new halakhot here. But rather, you're sitting at a wedding. It's 11 o'clock at night. The bar is an open bar. It happens to, I've been in this situation before. You're sitting at a table because that's where they assigned you to sit. The person sitting next to you, man, woman, a couple, family, they had a few lechaims already. They're people of very limited refinement. They start to talk about things and make jokes and bring up topics and, and you're sitting there, you're, you're trying to be a 
upstanding citizen of the world. You normally would never use such words at your table. You don't want your kids to hear such words. You don't want someone talking to your wife the way someone's talking to your wife, uh, so on and so forth. It's a disgrace for a person to be in that kind of situation. In many places, they have like a rabbi's table. They don't do that anymore to respect rabbis. Normally, it's to keep them away from the adverse citizens so nobody has to deal with the rabbis. But for the most part, this is an important thing. I, I've done this before. I'm not embarrassed to tell you. Somebody will invite me somewhere. Who else is going to be there? Let me tell me, you're going to invite me to that meeting. Who else is coming to this meeting? So then my wife was home. Someone's coming to the house to visit. Who's coming? Okay, I'm not home. I'm hiding. There's some people I don't. Uh, yeah, just to know. You have to know your. I've said this before about guests. Guests can be the best things that ever happened to you in your life, and guests can be the worst things that ever happened to your life. Now I was with other parents. You might like this. So my Shabbat table, men and women sit together, it didn't bother him. He said, just nobody, none of your guests should be sitting across from your wife. And you notice, my wife, she always tries to scoot around to my side of the table. People always try to offer her chairs. That's for a reason. Why? The unrefined people in the world that come to people's tables, Bo Hashem, not so much to men. But they started to start up with married women, they start up with married men, they start up, it's, a, it's an unbelievable situation what you have, and you have to know, that. put things in, stop, you have a guest that says inappropriate things, if I have a person in my Shabbat table sharing an inappropriate joke, they'll never be invited back to my house. I don't have time for it. Someone's going to use vulgar language in front of my children, I will never invite them back to my house. I'm doing you a favor. You're doing your guests a favor. I don't understand why people feel entitled. Your house, you have children, you have a spouse, you have a family, you have... You're allowed to say, this is not acceptable in my home. That's okay. What, what, <laughs> since when do you have to become the social services? It's not proper for a person who's refined to have to be in situations with people who don't, don't even begin to understand refinement. Is that fair? Is that democratic? I don't know if it's democratic, but it's the way you keep your families uh, sane and safe and healthy. And if anybody just wants to know, it's a to today, it's how you send me an article. I have a certain person who was so busy saving the world that his whole family was destroyed. Because you're willing to let all the... I remember even here, here, the craziest people sleeping at people's houses and drug addicts and, 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 and all kinds of people with sexual problems. That, 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 oh, we have to love every Jew. We have to, oh, you can love every Jew at a distance. You can love every person in the world without letting them into your house. Think a little bit. Sometimes... Yeah, more responsible to yourself about yourself how many people tried to help other people and then they themselves got dragged into this problem you have to know who you are Nikkei that people of refinement are always careful to, to stay in with people who were able to keep a certain level of dignity in their actions and their eating and their drinking and their and those kind of things there's kind of a pretense that somehow you can influence others without being influenced by others it which anyone in the helping professions a lot, which is not which are not accurate. No, <laughs> you're it's correct. They build like, I could help this, I could, but it wears the person down. It, even so, my wife is studying social work. Even if you think you're going to see a person, they commit suicide. You're just you keep emotions. But then the you're a human being. You see something you, you that affects you. You have to ask yourself. So you bring that home. You bring it to your own life. All of a sudden, you're you're. T you're the one who's trying to help other people, but now you're taking depression medication. Actually, what did you accomplish here? You send a soldier out to war, and they come back with PTSD. So what did you gain? You killed some people, you didn't even win the war, and now you have a whole group of people who are suffering because of that? Because people are not robots, they're not machines. They, they internalize the things they see, and the things they do, and the things that they experience doesn't mean that sometimes drastic times call for drastic measures. So sometimes we do what it takes. But the person has to understand that I, I'm influenced. There's one more halakha like this, and I'll share it, and we'll go to the Shukhan I'm reading to you now from the Ben Ishchai. In Parashat Tetzaveh. He has the laws of the blessings of the Kohanim. So you know that when the Kohanim come to the synagogue, even though they wash their hands in the morning, they still wash their hands again. Why? Because in the temple, the Kohanim, before they blessed the people, they would wash their hands. Who washed their hands? The Levim. We find that the Shulchan Aruch says that already in Spain, the Jews started a custom that the Levim would wash the Kohanim's hands. 
even though we don't have a temple, and even though they weren't actually performing the service, but we kept this custom going. So let me read to you what it says. Even though the Kohanim washed their hands in the morning. They wash their hands again, how up until their wrist. A full hand washing. And the Levi, that's me, we pour water on their hands. And before that, the Levi has to wash his own hands. Most people don't know this. For the Levi to wash the Kohanim's hands, he should wash his hands first. Because your hands are not pure, so how could you purify someone else's hands if by the time you touch the water, it's not pure? When they do their cut corning here, do the Levim go wash their hands first and then do it? So let's say that Levim, we rely on the fact that just an hour ago we washed our hands at home. Uh, okay. okay, I've been judging everyone. Sure. That's how that. Vim and Sham Levi, what happens if there's no Levi? There's only a Kohen. Wash And then there's only. No, Tell me how this works. The Kohanim are the priests. Yeah. Levim are the next tribe. After that, Israel are all the rest of the Jewish people. Who was supposed to be the tribe of the priests? Levim. Levim. Uh, originally, Levim. Yeah. Before this. Oh, well, the, the firstborn. Yeah. The firstborn. Very good. Oh, Originally, firstborn. every yeah. firstborn was supposed to be eligible to be a priest. That's why when a firstborn is born, we do a pidyon. Yeah. We we have a kohen who buys, kind of, we sell, you know, there's a whole exchange yeah, we yeah, do over yeah. there in order to redeem that. He says, listen, the kohen agrees that we're letting him off the hook. We still do that today. Yes. Yeah, pidyon yeah? abin. Uh, we don't do it in my family because we're levim, but in families that are not levim, they do this. Every firstborn boy. So, if there's no Kohen, this is what he says, so the Levim, uh, the, the firstborns lost their right to be Kohanim. Why? Send to the Golden Calf. Very good. They send in the Golden Calf. Very good. They were part of the Golden Calf. Or sometimes forget it. He takes from the tribe of Levi, he separates a group, and he makes Kohanim. That's why in the Tanakh you'll oftentimes see them referred to, not in the Torah so much, but in the Nevi'im and the Prophets, the Kohanim HaLevi'im, the Kohanite Levites. Because they are Levi'im. Kohanim right. are essentially just a group of Levi'im that were separated from the tribe of Levi'im. Vim Ensham Levi'im, if you don't have a Levi'im, Yotzek Lehem HaBechor Me'em Shu Petarech. A firstborn son, how do you determine firstborn? What if he's a firstborn to his father but not to his mother? Let's say they were married before. The mother had a child already, but the father didn't. Is he a firstborn? No. No. It's a firstborn from a mother. The mother is what determines. Why? The Torah uses the words, Peterechem, the first of the womb. So we go based on the mother. That means also no terminate. Very good. If there's a miscarriage before, if it was a C-section, because it didn't come out of the womb. No, it did. It didn't work. Correct. The halakha doesn't view that as a, as a real firstborn. This firstborn is in trouble. He has to fast, the fast the firstborns, but he doesn't get any of the rights of the firstborn. He has all the obligations, but none of the, the benefits. Vim and Shambicho, what if there is no firstborn? Yitlu batzmam, they should wash their own hands. Velo alide Israel, they should not let another person, I mean, it shouldn't be just the Israel, another Jew washing their hands. They should wash their own hands. So, Kohen, firstborn, themselves. Yeah. Some say, Sheim HaLevi Hu Tamit Chacham That if the Levi is a Torah scholar, Eno Rishai Litzok Maim Alidei HaKohanim He's forbidden from washing the hands of the Kohanim. Afilu Imiktzatam Talmidei Chachamim Umiktzatam Amei Haaretz Even if some of the Kohanim are Torah scholars and some of the Kohanim are Ugin Ramesses, how much more so if they're all ignoramuses? And the Torah scholar who is a Levi is liable for the death penalty from heaven if he washes the hands of a Kohen who is an ignorant. 
Because it's not innately that a Levi has to worship a Kohen. A Levi who is a Tamit Chacham has elevated himself to a place where a Kohen can also, if a Kohen is also a Taurus scholar, so then you have that, you solve all the problems. But a Kohen who is an ignoramus and a Levi who is a Taurus scholar, let me ask you this question. Two people are drowning in a river. Now these questions in the Talmud are not meant to, God forbid, you know, it's, it's meant to show importance of people. Two people are drowning in a river. A Kohen, the high priest, the Kohen Gadol, there's only one of them in the whole Jewish people, who's an ignoramus, he doesn't know Torah, because he was appointed to the position, politics. But he is the high priest. And a Torah scholar, who is a mamzer, he's a bastard child, born from illegitimate relationship. A woman who cheated on her husband. I mean, he's not allowed to marry a Jewish person for ten generations. If both of them are drowning a river, the Torah scholar who is an illegitimate child, and the Kohen Gadol, the high priest, who is not a Torah scholar, who do you save? You can only save one. Torah scholar. Halakha says you save the Torah scholar. Even if he's in Mamzer status. Like, Mamzer status does not affect him because he, as a Torah scholar, has elevated, elevated himself. himself. The Kohen Gadol, that's a nice political position that you have, but you didn't work hard to refine yourself. So interesting. The, the um, hashlachot, the ramifications of this teaching, are numerous. Huge. I mean, what it shows you is that the situation in which you're born doesn't doesn't bind you for eternity. You can change yourself. And the situation, the office in which you occupy, doesn't make you who you are unless you've refined yourself to be worthy of that position. The Kohen, just because he's born a Kohen, does not have a higher status than the Levi who has worked on himself to be a Torah scholar. So the, the Torah scholar who's a monster, he's it really elevated himself, but he can't marry a, a, a Jewish person. So it's it's a, okay, the laws of Mamzerut are very difficult. Very bad. They're, they're yeah. from the hardest laws we have in the whole Torah. And the agony that these halachot cause, let me explain. I don't even mind if we don't get the Shulam today, because what we're studying today is, is better than that. Today you have this phenomenon of um, Whatever we can get Jewish kids to do, let's get them to do it. Let's get them involved. Let's get them on board. So any Jewish couple that comes to a synagogue, sure, we'd rather you do a Jewish wedding. Come with us. Let's don't go to Cancun. We'll do a wedding at the synagogue for you. <laughs> and for every couple and their friends, we do a, a 100% legally binding Jewish marriage. The problem with that is not, not for every couple that gets divorced do we do a legally binding divorce. Halakhically. Mm -hmm. Now that I was in Israel, uh, Peretz gave me homework. He wants me to come back in if, however many years it takes to do smicha uh, on Gitin, on how to give gets. So I've already started the plot So this is a whole new world for this. I, I did conversion a few years ago. I didn't think it was a Baruch Hashem. Why? Because of this problem. Every rabbi around will give, will marry off a couple. But what happens when they get divorced? Who follows up? We don't have one Bedin in San Diego that can divorce a couple. That's a good ally. The couple who was barely interested in doing a Jewish wedding, I promise you, when they're getting divorced, they have no interest to schlep out to Los Angeles and meet some rabbi and make them do this, sign that, uh, pay this. They don't even know. They don't even know they have to do it. How many times do people get married again a second time? They come to a rabbi, and the rabbi says, Are you Jewish? Are you Jewish? Well, everybody, let's do a wedding. She's already married to someone else. Halakhically, she's still married. 30 years later, she's still married. Now, the kids born from that second relationship are mamzerim. If that kid grows up and he goes to yeshiva and he becomes a rabbi and he opens up, but now he wants to get married to a Jewish girl. He can't. We can't do that wedding. He's halakhically not allowed to marry into the Jewish people. I've heard all these leniencies and about that. I, there are leniencies. I'm not here to tell you. What I'm here to tell you is who made all these problems? The first, the first rabbi who wanted so much that people should get married in a Jewish ceremony oh. mm -hmm. without being responsible enough to make sure that they would get divorced afterwards. When people come here, I'm sorry, I, I, I like doing weddings. I said my first micha was do it. I rarely do weddings. Unless I know a couple and I trust a couple that, that if God forbid, and I, you never know, I don't have a guarantor, but that they would come talk to me if something would happen. That's the only time I'll do a wedding. When Ariella got married, uh, Max's rabbi checked us out of our past marital history, Jewish pedigree, everything. 
before doing the wedding for them. Correct. And, uh, I thought that was quite thorough. It's quite thorough. Yeah. I mean, we're, as always, there's a famous poem about uh, a city on top of a mountain, a, a cliff, and a city in the valley at the bottom. And they were always, people were always coming around to see the cliff and they were falling over. Mm-hmm. And they had an argument between the two municipalities. Should we build a fence up there? The guy said, we don't want to send money to build a fence. You keep an ambulance down there. <laughs> so, they said, no, an ambulance. Who keeps an ambulance at the bottom of a cliff? You just build a fence. You'll solve the problems. They were fighting and fighting and fighting. And in life, you oftentimes have people who are, instead of building a fence on the top of the cliff, they'd rather just keep an ambulance at the bottom of the cliff. <laughs> if I could summarize half the halakhot and the Jewish people oh, right. as people who refuse to build fences. They'd rather wait for the problem to happen and then figure out some mediocre way to deal with the problem. Don't wait for a person to get sick before you figure out how to get them bed. The whole world operates already in ambulance yeah. mode. This is the, the way we work in, in every field, not, not just in Judaism. Not being so hard to Jewish people today. When it comes to these halachot, how much better would it be if rabbis were responsible and said, don't worry, just, get, just go get married at Cancun. What will be? What will happen? How, how could they live together without being married? My friends, they've been living together for six years before they came back to the rabbi in the first place. What changed? You want to do a wedding? So do a wedding. It's such a fashion which would require them to come get a get afterwards. That could be their sort of prenups that have been suggested. I'm not here to stick my head in the laws of prenups. And there's some rabbis like them, some rabbis don't. I'm not here to, to, to discuss this. Today. This is a real problem. Here, the Ben Yishchai is saying that a Tamit Chacham, who's a Levi, shouldn't be washing the hands of a Kohen, who's an Amal. Now, he mentions this as an opinion. It's not everyone agrees to it. Right? But he says that the consequence, according to that opinion, is that he's degrading his... See, a Tamit Chacham doesn't have the right to demand his own honor. It has nothing to do with him. A Tamit Chacham is now a representative of something greater than him. And therefore, you, know, if a, a, you have to respect your parents. The halakha is when a father comes into the room, you stand up. A mother comes to the room, you stand up for them. You don't sit in their chair. You don't sit in their halakha like that. Now, what if the father says, no, come, I want you to help me on the computer. Come sit on my chair. Can you sit on his chair? Absolutely, you can. What about a king? The king, you have to stand up for him. You can't sit on a king's throne. You can't. What if the king says, no, come, come, you're my friend. We went to high school together. Come sit on my throne. Can, can he do that? No. No, why? Who owns, wh- why do we honor the king? Is it because of him? Is he that special of a person? It's his position. Um, position. It's the position. It's his office. It's the fact that if we don't respect this position, the whole country will go down the drain. Yeah. So he doesn't have ownership over his respect to be able to forgive it, to forgo it. This argument is saying that Tamit Chacham is the same way. Tamit Chacham, just because you've studied a lot of Torah, doesn't make anybody special. But you now represent the Torah. You represent Hashem. You're kind of a... a a figurehead for the Jewish people. You don't have the right to forego the Jewish people's national honor just because you want to be nice and wash somebody's heads. That's where this approach is coming from. And therefore, why is he liable for the death? We don't put him to death at court, but he's saying in Shemaim, he, because he's, so to speak, degrading Shemaim. He's, he's saying, I don't care about you. I, I can do whatever I want. And even though it says there are people who are lenient about this, they say you can wash a coin's hands. He says, if I were you, I would worry about this opinion. It's the kind of opinion, don't take lightly. There's a halakha that says, it's better for you to just sit in your chair and do nothing. What does that mean? You're not sure if you're allowed to do something? Or yes, that. Sometimes just, just don't do anything. Just, just stay away from it. Same thing. Even if he's the only Levi in the room, and he knows that if he doesn't wash his hands, the Goyan is going to have to wash his own hands, and so be it. You have to be careful when you do these things. This is, uh, you never want to come off like, I'm too good to wash your hands. It's not the point of this whole conversation. It's not the idea. Now, they said here in the Bitkana said, if there are other Levim, so I just stay in my chair. Now, the reason why I stay in my chair has very little to do with this. It more to do with when I was once the rabbi of another synagogue, to wash the Kohanim's hands, you had to leave the synagogue. And I noticed that in my absence, 
during the repetition of the Amidah, um, the Amidah became a jungle, like talking, drinking, moving. Mm -hmm. And it's almost like, you know, the teacher left the classroom for five minutes, so now the whole class uh, goes crazy. So I made it as if so long that there are other people to leave the room, Anyways, there's only one Kohen and 17 Levim, so I'm not going to get a chance to watch anyways. Are you familiar with that? It's been doing it whole life. So the little kid I've been watching the Kohenim's hands was it. Um, so one, you like the three people holding the handles of the cup, one person giving out paper towels, you know, like, there's only so much you could do out there. And so I decided, I'm just going to stay here to, you know, uh, supervise the synagogue. Today, Bok Hashem, I don't have those problems. Um, but there anyways are other people who are washing the Kohenim's hands, so... It's okay if I avoid this issue entirely. Um, but this is an important halakha to know. Because what it's telling you is you're not here to be arrogant towards anybody. You're not here to put down anybody. But you see this with parents. And I was on the airplane now. And <laughs> like, Thank you, Hashem, for not giving me these terrorist children that the people next to me on the airplane had. But you know who created the terrorist children? It was the parents. Now, there are children who are just difficult. There's nothing you can do about it. This is a, Hashem creates human beings with their nature, with their, with their life. But there are parents who just, they don't know how to be parents. There's no book you can read. There's no manual that you get when a child says, be a parent. But there's this culture today to give your kid whatever they want. Why? Because you want to be a good parent. You want to spoil them. You want, and what you find out is Hashem already says, Vaishman yishurun. When the Jewish people get fat, vayivat, we kick. Then when you feed a cow and he still kicks you, he's like, I just fed you. What do you mean you kicked me? Hungry cows don't kick people. They're waiting for food. Once they, oh, they relax, now they can kick people because they don't need you anymore. When we have this parenting method, you know, don't call me mom or dad, just call me by my first name. There's a halakha against that. We call our parents Abba and Ima. What do you mean? But we're in 2017 in the United States. Why do I have to oppress my child? You're not oppressing your child, you're not getting, you know, to the point where, listen to this, uh, parents doesn't let us call our spouses by any title. I mean, my wife, and she makes me upset sometimes, she says, Rabbi, you don't, don't call me, I'm, to her, I'm not a rabbi, to her, I'm her husband. It's not, you know, in a relationship, couples are equal to each other. So when does she do it? She does it when other people are around. That's okay, fine. I'm not going to get her case. I tried. It didn't work. That's what she does. Fine. But when I, you know, what do you tell your children? You call your wife, uh, Ima, mommy, da daddy. But it's not your mom. It's not your dad. It's their it's mom. It's the kid. Yeah. Somebody said, we call her Ima because we want our kids to know how to call her Ima. So my friend said, you know, I've raised Baruch Hashem X number of kids. I always called my wife by her name, and they still don't have any problem identifying who their mother is. So, uh, he's out. very part. They figured out that <laughs> I call her this, and they call her that. And these are not formalities. This is an important thing for a child to know that the relationship between two parents is not the same relationship as between them and their parents. Yeah. This is called postmodern, non-hierarchical thinking. Yeah. Everything. Everybody's the same. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and it's like in postmodernism. There's no difference between someone who's educated, who's not, who's a parent, and who's a child. And, you know, there's just no rank or order or level. And, and like I've said, about the, there must be value at some level. Something was fixed by this. I mean, there were problems and they're being fixed. But you have to question, what about the damage that it's caused? And I believe that it's tremendous damage with that. You know, we, we, uh, we see this. In California, for example, it's normal to call people by their first names. Even like your, I grew up and my friends' parents, we called them by their first name. You did? Sure. That's how I was. I, uh, is that weird to you guys here sitting in San Diego? I don't think I ever called him Mr. Rosenberg or Dr. Rosenberg. I don't think I ever used those words to him. I think I did. Put in fact, it might actually be offensive. It's like you want to be distant from a person, so you call them by some fancy title. When I moved to the East Coast, though, to Yeshiva, I mean, using Mr. Rosenberg or Dr. Rosenberg or Mrs. Rissman, that's, that's already, like, nice. That's already close. Then you go, sir, ma'am. Like, they're not... You only say sir and ma'am here if you don't know who the person is and you don't really care about them. You'll say, sir, okay, sir, you forgot your wallet on the table. If you know them, you'll never call somebody sir. 
different places have their own cultures and how they do those things. But there's what to be said about the uh, you know, halakha. It's interesting. The Pedal Yoetz mentions that you should not call anybody, especially rabbis, by their last name. The Pedal Yoetz says that if you call, let's say, I call him Rabbi Risman and not Rabbi Hillel, that's considered uh, disgraceful. And actually, that would be considered degrading a Torah scholar. Really? Because the last name is impersonal. And that's not the kind of relationship people are supposed to have with each other. It's very interesting. It really, it's a time a few hundred years ago. I once asked this to have parents. He prefers that people call him Rabbi Yaakov. Really? But in the world in which we live, if, if people were to see me call my rabbi Rabbi Yaakov, they would view me as like putting down my rabbi. Like, I think he's my best bud. Or but the people you talk about Rabbi Yaakov of Chatzira. So by the Sfaradim, all the Chachamim, we called them by their first names. Chacham, Mordechai, Eliyahu, Chacham, Ovadiyah, Chacham. We always called rabbis by their first names. But in Europe, this was very not accepted. Mm-hmm. And so we've kind of adopted that in America and Europe is a similar thing. People would much rather call me Rabbi Halevi. When I go to events and things like that, oh, Rabbi Halevi, Rabbi Halevi. I didn't choose my last name, Halevi. I didn't choose my first name either, but Halevi, everybody in my family is called the Halevi. I mean, young family, that's, that's why I am. There's a lot of chokhmah, a lot of wisdom in this field, and it's good that certain formalities have been able to be moved away, but it's bad that we don't know which ones to hold on to and which ones uh, to, to keep. I see that we're ready uh, close down to the class. Let me just then finish up the next paragraph on page 178 so we can at least have one whole Hamas Pigo of the Hashem class and not like a three minute uh, Shulchan Aruch class. On page 178. <laughs> so be careful then. Do not err and think that any of these actions we just warned of displays praiseworthy humility. When in fact it deserves criticism for it displays disgraceful character and a spiritual shortcoming. Apply this principle to other cases as the particulars are too numerous to list here. It's a very important sentence. This was the way Maybe if I'll have a minute, I'll share with you something nice to remind me about Sephardic Yeshiva. This was the way of Chachmei Sephardic. And Baruch Hashem, I, I study like this, at least for the last years of my Yeshiva, Be'arafelet, not to get stuck on details. Because you cannot learn things from details. You learn from principles, and then all the details come out of those principles. Tell you the someone wants to study laws of Shabbat, so they got a big, thick book of all the do's and don'ts of Shabbat. But they don't truly grasp the foundations on which these do's and don'ts are built. Those details, you can do this, you can't do that, but, you know, we know how to make tea on Shabbat, we know how we can heat up the food on Shabbat, we know how cooked the chameen has to be on before Shabbat, but how many of us, if we were asked the question, so what exactly is forbidden in terms of cooking on Shabbat? What is the definition of cooking according to the Torah? I mean, why is making tea in hot water not cooking? Mm. But putting food in the stovetop is cooking? Why is putting something in a third cup not cooking, but in a second cup, yes, cooking? I mean, we, get, we know a lot of details, but nothing unites these details. There's no foundation. When I was in the Shiva, our parents rarely taught us details. He would always teach us certain equations, I would call them. And they're brilliant to the equations because any variable that you plug into that equation will get you the right answer. That's the secret to education. Mm-hmm. Today, education is data-based, memorizing facts, so you can't get the whole picture. Many years ago, I, I met a scholar who taught at the University of Denver and in Yeshiva in Yerushalayim, and he had a method called the Rambam method. He said, first mm-hmm. learn the principle, then you'll get the details. He said, and they say it was backwards from what was being taught in Yerushalayam. Yeah. Amazing. Is this the way I was, and I'll say that's what shifted me when I was Yeshiva in Baltimore to when I went to Yeshiva in Yerushalayim. Which was in, in, in yeshiva, regular yeshiva. There's a, a big emphasis: memorize names, memorize page numbers, memorize. 
Uh, it doesn't make a difference what the page number was. You know where to look it up. That's important. Get the concept down. Because you might know the page number, but you forgot what it says on that page. Or you memorize what it says on that page, but you didn't grasp, actually, what it meant when it said that on that page. Understand things. Understand principles. And this is a whole... It changed the way I study. It also changed the way I teach. But, Baruch Hashem, that was an experience that I could have missed. So maybe now that I'm telling you that, I'll read one last sentence and I'll, I'll give you two minutes on Yeshivot. Everyone who proceeds on the way of the Torah must commit to this interpersonal humility. There's an exception. Unless he's in a position of authority, which leads other people. <coughs> and that's going to be next week's topic. A leader doesn't have the freedom like other people does. The other people do. Like other people do, in order to just give, forget, forgo their humility. Sometimes a leader has to stand up for certain things, and that's a, an important thing for a leader to do. And we'll talk about that in the next week.